Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you here this Thursday morning. My name is Raul Reis. I'm the chair of the journalism department here on campus. I also teach, one of the classes I teach is global news media, uh, which relates directly to this panel that we have here today, which is titled, The Global News Media. Is the balance and accurate story being reported? And I, before I introduce the panel, uh, I wanted to call your attention. Uh, earlier this week, I was looking at a non-governmental organization's website called Reporters Without Borders, and they listed on the website that in 2009 alone, 12 journalists have been already killed, and 138 journalists have been imprisoned. And sadly, as you know, we are still in early March. Um, when they issued their 2008 annual press freedom report, this is the world map that Reporters Without Borders included on the cover page. It shows how each country ranks when it comes to the protection of civil liberties for journalists. That's the map from 2008. And unfortunately, the red color that you see on the map means a difficult situation for journalists in those countries. I wish that map didn't show so much red, um, but that's the sad reality. Uh, among the most common threats to journalists were restricted as access to sources and official documents, direct and indirect censorship, and physical threats or actual violence against journalists. Another nonprofit organization, the Freedom House, which publishes the annual press freedom rankings for all countries, has warned about a continued decline in free speech and freedom of the press all over the world. They have no noticed this decline since 2001 and attribute, among other reasons, to the fact that governments, both authoritarian regime, regimes and democracies, are faced with new media technologies that enable an unprecedented number of journalists and citizens to make their voices heard all over the world. Of course, the downside of that is that these governments are trying to push back and in this process end up trampling on the rights of media organizations, professional journalists, and common citizens. According to the Freedom House, in 2008, 37 percent and only 37 percent of countries were rated as free or having a free media or a free environment for journalists to work in. 30 percent of countries as being partly free and the great majority of countries as being not free at all. This is the last Freedom House Press Freedom World Map available for 2008. It's the online one, if you can show. Um, and you can see how they rank the different countries according to how much freedom is granted to journalists, citizens, and the media in general. These statistics are sobering, but they certainly don't tell us the whole picture. The goal of this panel this morning is to discuss global media and freedom of the press in the context of the work that is done on a daily basis by professional journalists, both in the US and abroad, as well as by activists and non-governmental organizations working to improve press freedom. One of the best ways for us to have the discussion is by listening to what our honored guests and panelists have to say. Among the four of them, these panelists have amassed an incredible amount of information and personal experience. And I would like to introduce you to them and you see what I mean when I say that they have a lot of experience on these issues. Uh, a native of dusty West Texas, Pete Fuentes, grew up in a town that fostered both family and dreams, Balmoria, Texas, population 200. Pete's long journey from West Texas began in the USA Army with a posting as different from West Texas as night and day, Anchorage, Alaska. But it was in the Army that Pete discovered a career in broadcasting as a member of the Armed Forces Radio and Television Service and he was named Billboard Magazine's Air Personality of the Year for 1974. 
After discharge from the Army, Pete's career continued to flower, paying his dues back in Texas in places like Odessa, El Paso, Corpus Christi, and then here in California, in Salinas and Sacramento, before he moved on. Pete was then offered a job in New York, the biggest market in the country, and while he was at Channel 9 in New York, he won multiple Emmys for the feature news work that he did. In 1999, Pete Fuentes joined Fox 6 News as a special projects director in San Diego. His impressive, impressive achievements include 17 San Diego Emmys, and as head of special projects, Pete's unit has garnered more than 40 local Emmys. Since joining the station, he also won 12 Golden Mics and four RTNDA Moral Awards. He will tell you a little bit more about the consulting work he's currently doing. To his left, uh, the left of the table, Lucy Douglas. She's the executive director of the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, a voluntary, unincorporated association of reporters and news editors dedicated to protecting the First Amendment interests of the new media, news media. Based in Arlington, Virginia, the Reporters Committee has provided research, guidance, and representation in major press cases in state and federal courts for 36 years. Prior to assuming the position in January 2000, Douglas was a media lawyer for almost five years in the trial department of the Minneapolis law firm of Dorsey and Whitney. From 1980 to 1993, Douglas was a reporter and editor at the St. Paul Pioneer Press. As a reporter, she covered beats ranging from general assignment in suburbs to education in the courts. During her last three years at the Pioneer Press, she served as Night City Editor, Assistant News Editor, and National and Foreign Editor. Douglas was awarded the Wells Memorial Key, the highest honor bestowed by the Society of Professional Journalists in 1995. A year later, she was one of 24 journalists, lawyers, lawmakers, educators, research, librarians, and historians inducted into the charter class of the National Freedom of Information Act Hall of Fame in Washington. She earned a law degree in 1995 from Vanderbilt University, a Master's of Studies in Law from Yale in 1988, and a Bachelor's of Arts in Journalism from the University of North Dakota in 1980. On this side of the table, we have Bruce Wallace, who is the foreign news editor for the LA Times. Bruce was based in Tokyo and covered Japan and Korea. He has also done crisis reporting from Iraq, Lebanon, and Southeast Asia. Wallace joined the Times in 2004 after spending eight years as a foreign correspondent based in London for Canada's McLean's Magazine and the Can West national newspaper chain. During that time, he reported from across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East on stories ranging from the Balkan Wars to the collapse of the Oslo peace process in Israel. Born in Montreal, Canada, he holds a bachelor's degree in American history. Our next panelist is Elias Bondimu who is a free press activist and social entrepreneur and an exiled journalist from Ethiopia. The former managing editor of the Ethiopian Review magazine, he's the founder of Tsai Publishers, the African Tribune, and the International Journal of Ethiopian Studies. Currently, he serves as an executive board member of the PAN USA and the Black Journalists Association, Southern California. He also advises the Committee to Protect Journalists and the International Women's Media Foundation on matters related to freedom of expression in Africa. The institutions that he founded, like the African Academic Press and the Ethiopian Institute for Nonviolence Education and Peace Studies, are serving the larger community as an instrument to reverse Africa's severe brain drain. Locally, as a founding panelist of the LA Press Club's International Caucus, he has advocated for the inclusion of African journalists in the main activities going on in the city, and he's also active in the Southern California chapter of the New American Media. 
As a publisher, he's the founder and director of the first publishing house for the Loyola Marymount University. Welcome to all the panelists, and thank you for being here again. Well, what I had in mind to get it started is to focus on the experiences that these current and former journalists and activists have had, and also, uh, besides their personal experiences, the views that they have on the current state of international journalism and foreign news reporting, especially as it pertains to freedom of the press and the obstacles or dangers uh, for journalists doing their jobs. Um, I would also be interested in hearing their perspective on the status of foreign report vis-a-vis -vis the budget cuts that everybody's facing and the potential for biases, maybe political biases or national biases and inaccuracies in international reporting. Given the wealth of information and personal experience that they bring to the table, I'd like to give them at least 15 minutes. They came all the way, in some cases, from New York, so they deserve at least 15 minutes for their opening statements. Uh, we could follow that up with questions from me and from you, the audience, and also from each other so they can talk about these issues that are extremely important to them. So um, maybe we'll start with Pete Fuentes. Thank you very much, Raul. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, we'll get the, uh, the DVD started in a minute. At least we'll put the prompt up, and I'll let you know when to play it. It'll be the first one. Um, thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, the first things out of my mouth is the word impotency. Impotency. Don't worry, Raul, I'm in the right uh, forum here. It's, this is not the life sciences forum. It's uh, freedom of the press. I refer to that word because there was a great article in the Times just a few, about a month ago, where uh, they talked to someone in Juarez, right across the border from El Paso. They talked to someone in Juarez uh, and asked him what the state of affairs there is in Juarez. And he says, the police are impotent. There's impotency with our police department to keep the streets safe for public safety. He even said that he's seen people kidnapped at gunpoint put into a car in broad daylight, and people around the scene felt impotent to do anything at all, to do anything at all. These are the dangers that police and the public face. Where do you think the media falls in? Even lower. I had a case uh, with a station. I'm a consultant for Televisa. Uh, how many have heard of Televisa in Mexico? OK, just a few of them. It's a big broadcaster in Mexico, and I do, as my consultancy, I do boot camps for journalists. I conduct seminars, classes, storytelling classes. And I had an instance in Juarez where the news director says, this is what happened to us. He told me a story. He says, look, it's an hour before 6 o'clock. Our reporter has spent all day researching, doing a story out in the field. Comes back with a great story, which in this country, He'd be up for an award. An hour before the news, at 5 o'clock, they get a call. The station gets a call. The voice on the other side says, if you run that story, I will kill you. <clears throat> wow. 30 minutes pass. Another phone rings. The voice on the other side says, if you don't run that story, I will kill you. Intimidation, there's no win. So journalists are really being hammered and intimidated, especially in border towns. Tijuana is no different. Uh, Monterrey is no different. I had a station I was consulting, I have a station I was consulting in Televisa in Monterrey. Uh, recently, last month, they were bombed. There was a bomb went off in, in the front lobby, near the front lobby. So uh, people being intimidated, year and a half ago, one of Televisa's journalists in Acapulco was murdered right on the street. He was a journalist on both for Televisa and te television and on radio. So <clears throat> what's a journalist to do but to censor, self-censor the material that they, that they go out and cover? Many journalists 
will cover a story and only provide information that the police give them, official information. Why? They don't want to mention specific names, especially cartel members, in any of this. Many times, reporters, and you'll see them here in the US, they'll do a stand-up in the middle of a package, a bridge stand-up, where they're in the story commenting on the scene. Many times in Mexico, they don't want to even appear in the story. So it's a story with just, just a voice. And many bylines in Mexico is actually, you're signing a byline, you're signing a death certificate. Because they will find you, they know where you live, and they will come and kill you. Absolutely. I have two examples. Uh, if you bear with me, we'll play the first story. Let me set it up. I did about a couple years ago. That was when Fox was still president. And um, we have some brave journalists that are defending you know, the public's right to know, freedom of the press. And I'd like to profile a couple. The first one's a day of story, which I did that same day. The second one is an investigative story. Let's uh, play the first one. Well, as you know, reporters cover the news. They're not supposed to become part of the story. But in Mexico, many journalists are often victims of death threats and violence. Fox 6's Pete Fuentes takes a closer look in a special Unit 6 investigation. Staffers in this newspaper office pay a heavy price to work here. Two of Zeta's journalists are dead. And publisher Jesus Blanc Cornelas nearly survived an assassination attempt. These days, Mexico has an infamous distinction. It has replaced Colombia as the most dangerous place among the Americas for journalists to do their job. What kind of a country is this that can't afford a journalist the opportunity to work? The main problem is Mexican police are not doing their basic job of providing public safety. Editor Adela Navarro often criticizes police for helping the assassins. Zeta has linked killings to the PGJE, or the state police suspected of working with cartel hitmen. Last year, Adela's boss, Francisco Ortiz, was gunned down, and to this day, police have no one under arrest. Navarro took Ortiz's position as editor of the newspaper. We don't consider this a dangerous job to the point that we are intimidated. In fact, this is what drives us. As long as I do my job as a fair investigative journalist, my life is not in danger. I was nervous because uh, you, you never expect that somebody came to you and say, I'm going to send somebody to, to kill you. Estos son los límites del aeropuerto internacional de Tijuana. Odelon Garcia is a broadcast journalist for Televisa. He also hosts a morning radio show. In between interviews, he's following breaking news. This time, two cops are injured in a shootout. Often, Baja police have been targets of gangland killings. Odelon is wary of officials. Other than his wife, Marcela, he trusts very few people. He's not scared at all. At all. He speaks whatever he thinks. Marcela knows speaking your mind can get you in trouble. In the past year, 15 journalists have been killed in Mexico. Every day he walks out of the house, I'm, I'm scared and I, I, I uh, pray to God for him. Marcela was born into the business. Her father and mother were journalists. Now Marcela is pregnant and knows the odds are dangerously against journalists like Odelon. Sometimes he's there in the fires, in the shootings, in the middle of everything, and I'm scared. In Tijuana, Pete Fuentes, Fox 6 News. Journalists in Mexico have demanded President Fox step in. They ask for stiffer penalties for crimes against journalists. They also demand new investigations as a way of ending the culture of impunity in Mexico. All right, you can stop there. Lights, please. And I'll play the second one in a few minutes. <clears throat> I love the work the Los Angeles Times has been doing, by the way, they covering Mexico. They have been doing an outstanding job for the past couple of years, even before that, but especially in the past couple of years covering this violence. I was at a forum last uh, two weeks ago in, in, uh, in San Diego. Terrific. Uh, 
and I say the LA Times because I've got to credit them because they report that drugs make up a $35 billion problem. It's not much compared against the TARP funds or 700 billion or more than that that they're talking about now. 35 billion may be a drop, drop in the bucket. But compared to the peso, if you know it's trading 15 to one, that's hundreds of billions uh, that's, uh, that's being made down there. The Transborder Institute in San Diego says more than 6,000 people were killed in drug violence last year alone. Now the toll already for these two past two months, or a month and a half, is already at 1,000. So they may, they may even break that. But uh, there are other forms of censorship that I want to give you. Uh, I'll touch, of course, I've touched on the drug violence, and I'll show another video about the uh, impact of the drug violence there. But I can't, I'll be remiss if I can't uh, explain really the other two factors uh, that are endangering freedom of the press in Mexico. And it's the old PRI system. Uh, in the year 2000, the old party, the Revolutionary Party, the PRI was defeated. So you say, yay. Democracy won. Well, in a way. This is how the old system worked. The PRI was the uh, spoke in the wheel. The hub. The hub in the wheel. Sorry. Was the hub in the wheel. And the spokes was government. Me, government, media, and yes, they even regulated, played referee among the drug cartels. The government themselves has been documented by the LA Times and others as being involved in the drug traffic all this time. They were the referee among the drug cartels, so there was relative peace. But what happened in the year 2000, the end of the PRI, and the decentralization, democracy brought about a decentralization. I'm trying to give you a big picture as to why things are happening. That old system was busted up. And what remained were fragments of all the different corporations, even drug trafficking, media, just fragmented to where nobody was playing referee. And now it's helter-skelter. That's just a simplistic explanation that I was given by the uh, Center for US-Mexican Studies at UC, um, at USD, and also uh, UC La Jolla, in La Jolla, UC uh, SD. SD, UC San Diego. I was given that as a simplistic uh, explanation to give you guys an idea as to why things are happening like this and to why this culture evolved. I was in a course in Acapulco. I was in a course in Acapulco and I was giving them a, a week-long seminar and I asked them what type of stories are they covering. And these correspondents covering that whole area were, were saying, well, we do mostly feature stories for the uh, evening news. I said, well, what about investigations? What about the big stories? Oh, we can't touch those. What do you mean? Well, the people in control in Mexico were actually literally telling them what to cover. They were literally guiding and leading the news, their own coverage, their own way, as to what they wanted covered for the day. Not what was happening out there, but the agenda that they have. And this is from that old PRI system that I talked about where there was a lot of uh, uh, censorship at that time, it's still around. And these news managers from those eras are still in the news departments controlling the news that people get. Now, there's another part of the censorship that I consider, it, and it, it has to do with commercials, advertising. Uh, I've been at several stations where the anchor, the actual news presenter, will be doing the news and they cut to commercial and there's a spot of the anchor selling mattresses, sofas, furniture, uh, eyeglasses for a surgeon, cosmetics for this or cosmetic. The actual anchor is involved with that. The biggest problem with advertising in Mexico is that I asked them, who's your biggest advertiser for these independent stations? And they said, the government. 
The government is our biggest advertiser. We survive because of the government. So how can they be critical of their own government and they are not critical? They're biting the hand that feeds them. So those, uh, those examples exist in Mexico. One news director in Juarez, I was appalled that he, there was a celebration in a local town near Juarez, and he called up and, and told them, okay, I'll cover your story, but I'll charge you some money for it. Not only that, he was put up at a hotel, given meals and everything, covered the story, made his money, came back, the story never aired. He happened to be fired just a, a few weeks afterwards, and the story never aired. Those poor people in that town finally wrote a letter, and I read it, and they said, what happened to our video? We paid this guy this money, and, we, and he, he even called back and wanted more money, so we even gave him more money to cover a story. So, you know, those things are happening within the realm of, of, of what I have to work with day in and day out in Mexico. The biggest, also with this, one of the biggest obstacles is actually big corporate commercial or the rich people in Mexico. There's a guy named Carlos Slim in Mexico and the Times had, again, a great article on him. This is the second richest man in the world and owns uh, the, tele the uh, telephone company in Mexico and cellular company in Mexico. He's made billions. So let me read you from a quote actually from the Times. With telecommunicating, uh, telecommunications, retailing, and construction companies under his command, Mr. Slim looms large over the media landscape in his country. Notoriously thin-skinned, he does not have to pick up the phone and bellow at those who publish and broadcast something he does not like. His vast resources often translate into less than critical coverage. Raimundo Riva Placio, a veteran journalist in Mexico City, said that after he wrote a column in El Universal newspaper in 2006 condemning Mr. Slim as, as a monopolist, a Slim advisor threatened to remove newspaper ads from his company. That is no small threat. Mr. Slim's holding are so vast that he controls a large chunk of all advertising countrywide. Mr. Slim's estimated wealth was almost, or more than $44 billion at the end of last year. So that pressure, along with all the little things, the little things I told you about the news director is small in comparison, but they're both still violations. How'd you like to have a guy like this breathing down your neck? Now, I, I tend to look at the positive. I tend to look at heroes who are really making a difference and standing up not only to people like this or the drug smugglers or the uh, uh, cartels. I tend to look at them as heroes. There are a few people who are standing up for their rights and we need to acknowledge them. One is Jesus Blancornelas. How many of you have heard of Jesus Blancornelas? Good, I'm glad I brought a video so you can meet him. I did an investigative story on him. Uh, a few years back uh, with uh, my producer. And uh, he won the Daniel Pearl Award uh, a couple years ago, and he also won the Press Freedom Award. Here, it was presented here, right here in Los Angeles. Without further ado, let's play the second one, and then I'll wrap it up. Uh, Jesus Blanco Nelas has dared to tell the kind of stories that get journalists killed in Mexico. Truth is a frightful word for criminals involved in drug trafficking. But for years, Blancornelas has been a trailblazing reporter with the guts to take a road less traveled. this Tijuana newspaper man with the guts to publish the truth. In Estados Unidos, in the United States, there's very well organized crime. And in Mexico, it exists the disorganized crime. In Mexico, they kill drug smugglers and journalists. My name is Jesus Blancornelas, and I am editor of the newspaper weekly Zeta. Zeta is published in Tijuana, home of Mexico's most notorious drug cartel. They blocked us off. 
the windows came down. Empezaron a dispararnos con. They started shooting at shooting at us. But my friend Entonces, took me, uh, put me to the ground, and he was the one that received all the shots. Como que me habían pegado. And en all of a sudden, it felt like someone hit me on my back. Y me empezó a faltar el aire, ¿no? And I started gasping for breath. No se me olvida que me They told me I'm never going to forget it. 183 shots were fired. Miraculously, only four hit Blanco Cornelas. He was rushed into surgery. His driver, who was hit with 38 rounds, was dead. After six or seven days, I started regaining consciousness. But really, I didn't expect this attack. Police say one of the gunmen in the attack, David Baron Corona, was a career criminal with ties to the Ariano Felix cartel. The assassin was caught in the crossfire of his own men. Do I have feelings about this place? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, it has a special meaning to it, knowing that my father would have died here. Yo no tengo guerra contra el narcotráfico. I am, I am not at war against the drug traffickers. Los arellanos son narcotraficantes. The arellanos are drug smugglers. Yo soy periodista. I'm a newsman. Yo tengo que escribir sobre lo que ellos hacen. I have to write about what they do. Why do I use a vest? Because no, they tell me to use it, not because I want to. ¿Por qué tengo guardia? Why do I have bodyguards? Because it was an order from the president of, the, of Mexico when I came out of the hospital. And President Fox continued the protection. So that's why I have bodyguards. Son miembros del ejército. They're members of the Mexican military. In the past 30 years, more than 100 journalists have been murdered in Mexico. In the last seven years, 500 reporters have been targets of violence. In 1988, Zeta columnist Felix Miranda became one of the statistics. That day really was a surprise. Because he was ambushed, shot him with that shotgun. It's been 13 years that we've been asking. And we have 13 years that the government hasn't done anything. The same thing happened, it's happening on my case. No han detenido a nadie. They haven't detained anyone. If, even um, if my colleagues did the investigation, they identified all the uh, assassins, but the government hasn't done anything to detain them. Ese es nuestro problema. That's a problem. The Tijuana mayor says the state has jurisdiction over the investigation, Pero, not the city. <laughs> Journalists argue that officials keep passing the buck, resulting in little or no progress. Well, there's a lot of interest involved. There are a lot of political and economic interests. And on my case, it's pretty difficult to detain the Arellano Felix. We've published a lot of articles that other newspapers wouldn't publish. CETA stands for the last letter in the alphabet, Z. Newspaper readers know it as the word of truth. What does it mean, the name CETA for me? It means a lot, it means respect, family, teamwork, and it means a whole life, a whole life that, that's my dad's life. In 1997, what happens is that in 1997, supposedly the doctors, they said that I was supposed to die. And I come to the conclusion that God saved my life. So I'm convinced that no one's going to kill me. I'm convinced that I'm going to die. Cuando Dios diga. When God says so. No cuando digan los narcotraficantes. Not when the drug smuggler says so. If I could do what I wish I could do, I would travel a lot. It is a dream. Y es un sueño que se va a hacer realidad. And it's a dream that's going to come true. For Blanc Cornelas, the threat, death threats continue to come in. He continues to walk around with bodyguards and keeps on publishing his weekly newspaper. And who knows, one day he might get to print about the elimination of the drug cartel in Tijuana. Pete Fuentes, Fox 6 News. For Thank the you. first... That's fine. Thank you. Uh, lights. Uh, I know I've taken a big chunk of my time, so I'll, uh, I'll quickly uh, exit. But uh, that, uh, that's a guy that, to me, is a real hero. I did that story about six, seven years ago. And the violence has even escalated even more. Uh, he passed away, sadly, two years ago. Uh, under natural causes. Of course, being shot four times uh, 10 years ago didn't help, but he uh, passed away and uh, he remains to me, you know, right up there uh, with Murrow and the other guys as defenders of the truth uh, 
and the, and the spoken and the written word. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Everyone, and I appreciate it. Nice being here. Before, can you guys hear me? Before we move on, uh, I have two quick announcements to make. One is that uh, it's, you probably found on the table, the, the chairs that you're sitting on, uh, some notes, uh, index cards. Uh, those are for questions. If you have any questions for the panelists, please write them down, and then a student volunteer will come up to pick them up so we can read them uh, for the panels. And the other thing is, if you have to leave for a class, we know that some of you might have to leave for a class before the end of the panel. We ask you that uh, you do it quietly, and also to warn the, the panelists that some students might be leaving to go to a class, so don't take it personally. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Our next speaker is Bruce Wallace who is the foreign news editor for the LA Times. And since I only come from Los Angeles, I'm going to take 15 minutes. For it. Um, yeah, I was thinking back to the, some of my first experiences in foreign news were back in, in Ottawa longer ago than I care to think about, um, where I was working and where one day we got word that a couple of hundred Tamil had washed ashore and on the Newfoundland coast. This was a big deal in Canada because after the Vietnam War, there weren't too many people trying desperately to get in across the border from the United States. Uh, most immigrants can just come in and land. So the fact that somebody would actually try to sneak in seemed to be a pretty big story. So uh, the Ottawa Press Corps sort of gathered together at the airport and was prepared to get on a plane to fly out to Newfoundland. We were joined by uh, Ken Freed, who was then the Los Angeles Times correspondent in Canada, because back then, the Los Angeles Times had a correspondent in Canada. Glory days. And uh, we all got up and got on the plane, and the Canadian press corps dutifully marched to the cheap seats in the back, and Ken plunked himself right down in first class. <laughs> Ken, what's going on? And he said, well, you know, the paper was owned by the Chandler family then, and he said, you know, it's my duty as a foreign correspondent. I have strict instructions to try to reduce Otis Chandler's tax exposure at every opportunity. <laughs> and I thought, man, that's the place I want to work. <laughs> But somehow the glory days like that have gone, um, which underscores one of the problems when it comes to covering foreign news and covering human rights issues. And it's less philosophical and somehow sometimes may seem a little more mundane, but it's just an issue of, of money. You've probably read that we have a few problems at the Times these days. Somehow we've become a bit of a, uh, we're sort of the anecdotal lead for every story about difficulties in the newspaper industry now. Um, and this has real impact on, on, on what we do. Uh, it, it reduces the amount of resources you have. It reduces the number of correspondents you have to cover the world. We no longer cover the terrible human rights abuses in Canada. Um, it also has led to sort of philosophical changes about the way newspapers should be run as everybody desperately searches for a way to find a future. So there are many people who believe, and many of these people, uh, many people believe that the the future is in being relentlessly local in approach and leaving foreign news to someone else, although it's a little bit of a mystery who that might be, because I've never bumped into a Google reporter on the road. Um, and many of you may also just say, so what at this point? You know, this may sound like the lament of, uh, of old media, what, what's the impact? Bloggers will do it, citizen journalists will do it. And, and you're right in part, actually. Nobody pretends anymore in our business that we have a monopoly on um, on, on, on covering this stuff, on writing about it. Uh, but I would argue that it still does matter. It matters because um, well, I think our record actually would demonstrate to a certain degree that it matters, the stuff that Pete mentioned, uh, the inability of, uh, of Mexican journalists to be able to report as openly as they would like, to be able to uh, say what they want. We, we have spent a lot of time cover covering the Mexico situation. Our reporters do run bylines. They do put their pictures up uh, and, and do videos on our website. Um, we cover that. My experience in Japan for it was also, uh, it showed me that even though Japan has a, a very large uh, media sector, there are an awful lot of stories that go unreported there related to, in particular, the, some of the deficiencies in the Japanese justice system, which is a subject for another seminar or, or talk sometime, but are quite extensive and just do not get covered there. So there's something that's brought to it by, uh, by having foreigners come in and take a look at your country. Uh, uh, foreign correspondents, if they, if they do it as a profession, uh, bring 
analytical abilities to things. They bring a comparative ability to, uh, to, to, the, to the, the places they go and the subjects they, they study. And we still do, despite the diminished resources, have the ability to get into places which just the average blogger can't do. Our security setup in Baghdad costs us over a million dollars a year. Um, that's just, you know, beyond, uh, it's beyond the reach of, of most of you. Um, we had a reporter in Burma three times this year. He went back. He had the ability to see it not just once, but to go back repeatedly to see people on an ongoing basis. He's written quite bravely and extensively about human rights abuses in Burma. Uh, we had our reporter, Robin Dixon, who's based in Johannesburg, uh, made almost a dozen trips into Zimbabwe last year, which uh, I don't think is a, sort of a staple of the, of the evening news or anywhere else in this country. She did it mostly by, by traveling on, by land and, and getting across rivers. Uh, we're in Congo, in Somalia, uh, Iran, and China. In other words, we're still in those places. We're still doing this. And uh, it's just one of those things that uh, you have to be careful what you wish for when you attack mainstream media because someday that'll be gone. Um, anyway, it's, it's simply to underscore the notion that, uh, and the importance of resources in this, in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Lucy Douglish, the, the committee to, re, uh, to protect reporters. <laughs> the reporters sorry. committee the reporters for freedom, committee of, for the freedom press. of the press. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I, I'm going to follow up a little bit, I think, on what um, Bruce was just talking about. Uh, the reporters committee is based in Arlington, Virginia. We've done work on behalf of journalists who work in the United States for the last almost 40 years. Uh, I have a team of lawyers who, um, who help any journalist who calls us with a legal problem related to gathering and publishing or broadcasting the news. I have seven lawyers on my staff who answer our hotline 24 hours a day, uh, and all of my lawyers have a background as a journalist. Uh, we, I am an expert on press freedom as it relates to the United States. And after what Pete has told us, and what I think you're going to be hearing from Elias, uh, I have to acknowledge we have it good here. And so I don't want to make it sound uh, like I do not recognize that most journalists around the world have it a lot harder than we do here. But I would like but we have it good here, and we have to work very, very hard to keep it good here. So I'd like to talk about the United States model of democracy and politics and money. You know, we're very lucky in this country we have a First Amendment. Based on enlightenment thinking of our founders, they recognized that it was a fundamental human right for our citizens to be able to speak. We had freedom of speech written right into the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of, the speech, freedom of speech and of the press. Now, why is that press clause there? It's not because journalists are special people. Trust me, they're not. They're just human like the rest of us. No, it's, t it's um, I would suggest that it's because in this country, our founders decided that self-determination is a fundamental human right. How do we govern ourselves? We vote, right? We all go to the polls. In November, we had a sea change. It was the public who stood up and said, we want to change. Now, our system of democracy really operates on faith and information. We have faith that voters will seek out truthful information and use it to make informed decisions at the ballot box. But they cannot do that in a vacuum. Voters don't have the time or the resources to gather all of that truthful, independently collected information on their own. Rather, we count on the independent, non-government sponsored press to do it for us in this country. That system of a watchdog press has served us very, very well for more than 200 years. But these days, more and more people are able to serve that press function because of the internet. 
You don't need a press or you don't need a broadcast license to gather and disseminate news. In many respects, this ability of citizens to act as journalists will serve us very, very well. But I'd like to, as I said, follow up on a little bit about what Bruce said. I'd like to share with you some of the things, some of my observations that have literally been keeping me up late at night recently. It is very, very popular in this country to bash the mainstream press, to bash media consolidation, to bash them for stifling independent voices, and to really, really get down on corporate media in this country. But from where I sit, here is what mainstream media and the corporate press has done on behalf of the public. They have trained journalists. They have trained them very, very well. These people up here that you see, they didn't just decide to start reporting and do it very well yesterday. They trained at it, they worked hard at it. There is a wealth of experience in our mainstream press corps out there. Now, our laws do not appear by magic and they are not enforced by magic. We have some very, very ju good judge-made law and statutes in this country that protect the public's right to know what its government is, is up to. As I said, they, those laws do not appear by magic. Our laws, by and large, over the last 40 to 50 years in particular, have been fought for and enforced by the mainstream media. It has been the mainstream media, led by large media companies, that have fought to get courtrooms opened in this country. There was a body of law in the late 70s throughout the 80s. These cases, any of you who are here as law students might know them, or if you've taken media law, you will recognize them. Nebraska Press Association versus Nebraska versus Stewart. That said, that a judge cannot tell a reporter who is sitting in a courtroom that he or she cannot report a story. Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia. That said that criminal courts in this country are open to the public. Press Enterprise 1 and 2, Press Enterprise out of Riverside here in California. Those cases said that if a jury is being picked, you have the right to see who is sitting on that jury. And you know who paid for that? It was the media. You as the public have directly benefited from that. It was the media led by the American Society of Newspaper Editors that led the battle for state and federal open government laws. It was the state press associations. You have a right to go into a public meeting and you have a right to go to a county board or a school board and say, I want to see the superintendent's salary. I'd like to see the resume of the guy you just hired to run our school system. And you know who it was that fought for that and paid for all of that? It was your local newspaper. They led the effort to protect whistleblowers and confidential sources in state after state after state. If you are a government employee and your employer will not listen to you when someone is reporting that someone is embezzling money from a county board, no one would listen to you. You went to your local newspaper reporter, your local television reporter, and said, I'd like to tell you about something that is being done that is wrong, but you have to protect me because I will lose my job. It is your local media and your national media that led that. It is your media that led the effort to make sure that except under the most extreme circumstances, the government may not censor or restrain what is reported or said. Those laws, this fact that you cannot prevent the New York Times or the Washington Post from, prevent, from publishing the Pentagon Papers. That applies not only to the media, but that applies to you on your blog. That applies to you as you, if you were publishing anything. It applies to citizens as well as the mainstream media. Media companies did this for you. It wasn't cheap. They made money so that they could spend money on your behalf. Most of it was done by major newspaper companies. Now, they've hit very hard times, as Bruce mentioned. The Rocky Mountain News in Denver closed last week. The Kentucky Post and the Cincinnati Post closed at the end of the year. The Detroit newspapers are down to only distributing newspapers in paper form three days a week. Minneapolis, Philadelphia, the Tribune Company, they're all in bankruptcy. 
Journalists are being laid off, dozens of them, every day. Yesterday, the Columbus Dispatch laid off, I think it was 42 people in their newsroom. The Seattle Post Intelligencer and the San Francisco Chronicle have both said they are in danger of closing by the end of the month. That would leave San Francisco without a daily newspaper, folks. A major daily newspaper. I'm very afraid, I'm very, very afraid that these folks won't be able to continue these battles. And who's going to suffer? Well, let's forget about the journalists and the bloggers. You know, they'll still, the bloggers, they'll all still be there. They won't have any money under the current model, so um, you citizens are going to suffer. No one will be out there to fight the court and legislative battles to ensure that you can continue to get access to truthful, independently gathered information that you need to make decisions at the ballot box. Um, who's going to keep a check on government? Who's going to keep a check on big business? Do you know where your tax dollars are gonna go as far as this huge bank bailout? I don't know that anybody out there except maybe Bloomberg, which is supported by um, non-advertising revenue, is gonna be able to report where any of this money is going. That's your dollars. Um, you know, good luck everybody. We have a really, really big problem in this country. So we don't have journalists getting shot on street corners, but we have a real problem right now with our ability to get the information that we need to continue operating as a democracy in the way that we've become accustomed to for the last 200 plus years. Thanks. Last speaker, Elias Wondimu. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, it will make very difficult my presentation, especially after listening to Bruce and Lucy, uh, especially giving us the <clears throat> the sign of the the times, what's happening at, in current situations. But since uh, we're presenting this panel to uh, future journalists uh, who will be uh, um, uh, the leading writers and reporters of uh, the next generation, I would, I would like to continue with my prepared presentation. And I'm a bit critical of the uh, mainstream press, the international media, uh, on how it has been covering some of the issues that matters to uh, where I come from. So um, um, I will uh, uh, share this. Uh, the present conference has convened to foster a dialogue over the, the challenges faced by uh, freedom of expression and belief uh, more specifically. And within the discussion, our panel will uh, consider the role of the global news media placed in freedom of expression. Uh, the present analysis may be divided into two main parts. Firstly, recognizing the way in which the global uh, news media outlets have a monopoly on the production of knowledge about uh, and the representation of Africa which shaped public opinion and policy. And secondly, um, acknowledging the need to forge independent media outlets within Africa itself so that it may be more empowered in the shaping uh, the, the way in which um, its identity is represented internationally. Uh, in a paradoxical turn of events, um, one of the largest threats to Africa as a whole and free press, uh, particularly in the global news media, these outlets control the perception of everyday people have Af of Af uh, Africa uh, to a frightening degree. Uh, they portray Africa as a continent beyond any hope of its restoration, lack of depth analysis within sensationalist, uh, highly uh, exaggerated, uh, exacerbates uh, this problem uh, as human interest stories displaying the conflict or genocide and engaging in no further analysis than the designation of these terms entail uh, parad uh, the inner pages of newspapers while nothing is ever said about the practical, simple ways in which individuals may contribute to the forging of solutions to these problems. While respectfully acknowledging the invaluable importance of covering these stories, uh, despite uh, difficult circumstances that was uh, earlier uh, uh, discussed, 
um, we feel very little is done in the way of representing positive messages which uh, are being taken and which could be additional contribution to assist the plight of African people. What uh, exponentially worsens the present condition is the inability of Africans to represent themselves via media outlets as uh, the, the only uh, existing ones are uh, relatively small or usually censored by the political regimes under which they uh, reside. Uh, as a result, uh, Africans uh, have no control over the image deployed internationally in their name. Not only in their there is a deficiency in the quality of news about Africa, there is also a scarcity in the quality of news stories about Africa in the US media. An analysis of 10,000 stories from 1972 to 1989, ABC, NBC, CBS, only 2.2% uh, of the stories were about Africa, 2.2%. Uh, imagine from 1972 to 89. Uh, and the sad percentage of uh, the continent, which is over 54 countries and more than uh, 800 million people. In a related uh, vein, the New York Times reported uh, between 1955 to 1995 showed 73% of all its stories about Africa were negative. Uh, furthermore, Brill's um, Content, a media watching magazine, examined two stories of uh, Newsweek and Time regarding the, 1970, the 1994 Rwanda genocide and, uh, uh, and uh, the 1999 murder of eight uh, tourists uh, uh, on the Uganda Rwanda border. Uh, shockingly, Time reported 1,898 uh, words about the tourists and 797 words about. Uh, the genocide. Uh, Newsweek uh, produced 1,387 words and, uh, about the tourists and 775 about the, the genocide. So you can see where the focus lies. Uh, that's what I meant by the, uh, the lack of reporting or even the depth of coverage. Among the many consequences of this negative coverage of Africa as a politically uh, backward and dark continent, uh, is the lumping together of all African as uh, a one nation, uh, allowing Western governments to avoid accountability regarding their policies towards specific African governments due to the collective ignorance inspired by the homogenization represent, uh, representation, uh, re homogenized representation of Africa as the wound in the face of uh, human rights development, no s scrutiny they can be applied to actual political stances of Western governments, thereby creating one of the biggest plugage of honest attempts to assist uh, the, the continent. Exemplary here are the relations between the United States and Ethiopia, uh, where uh, despite extensive proof of the abuse of current Ethiopian government against uh, basic rights such as the freedom of expression within the State Department's human rights report. Uh, the United States continues uh, to support the current political region. Uh, the conspiracy of ignorance as fostered by the global news media allows individuals to ignore the way in which their government funds military political regimes abroad as uh, has been the, uh, the case fitting with Ethiopia. Uh, this brings us to the second component of uh, the analysis that I wanted to share earlier. Uh, although the Ethiopian constitution and the 1992 press law uh, uh, both explicitly protects the right of the freedom of expression, the Ethiopian government commits vicious acts of censorship against its people. Uh, to further our point, uh, all of the following evidence uh, was taken from the U.S. State Department's Human Rights Report on Ethiopia between uh, the year 2000 to 2000, uh, up to present. By the end of 2001, this is from the State Department's report, uh, by the end of 2001, over 14 journalists remained abroad uh, in exile rather than facing uh, charges uh, upon returning to Ethiopia. Uh, including the editors of Yamita, Saif and Balbal and Goh in 19, 2004. I mean, in 2004, uh, there were reporters that police harassed, beat, uh, beat and uh, detained um, 
uh, once a journalist was Arayatas Famariam, who alleged uh, that on October 1st, uh, three men wearing federal police uniform uh, assaulted him and threw him off near a river in the Yeka neighborhood uh, in Addis. Uh, now he can't walk, and despite uh, his request to a police investigation, this matter uh, was not reported, uh, investigated at that time. Uh, after the May 2005 election, which the opposition uh, party gained a tremendous uh, success in getting uh, uh, vote, um, uh, it was also uh, the year that the uh, government effectively uh, silenced uh, the uh, private newspapers. That year, eight newspapers were banned after their publishers and editor-in-chiefs were arrested. Uh, six other journalists seized publication uh, directly as a result of the government crackdown on the government on printing presses, uh, refusal to print the papers. Um, uh, what's more, the closed papers have a combined total readership of circulation about 400,000 at that particular time. Um, in 2005, uh, the government arrested 16 journalists in addition to opposing, uh, opposition party members by uh, statutory uh, provisions on the uh, publication of false information, incitement of ethnic hatred, and li liable uh, charging them with treason, genocide, and attempt to subvert constitution. These are uh, uh, the, the cases that uh, charge it, um, which not only appeal to uh, interest in the sensationalist human rights, uh, uh, but also uh, carry with them with the maximum penalty of life imprisonment or the death penalty. Um, uh, in what was uh, at the first glimpse of hope in, 2000, in, Ma in March 3, 2006, uh, the Federal High Court lifted 17 months ban on the Ethiopian Pre-Press Journalists Association, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, president of that, that um, uh, association, uh, Kifle Mulat, who is now in exile in Houston, uh, was the one of the uh, award winner of the Freedom to Write Award by Penn USA. Uh, on uh, July 1st, 2007, uh, this is more pressure is being uh, put into the, the, the media, the parliament passed a mass media and freedom of information proclamation which prohibits uh, pre-trial pre detention of journalists and censorship of the private media and it uh, recognizes the right of journalists to to form professional association, while in many regards this is a blessing and a sign of progress, it is also important to note that the law allows only incorporated companies to publish print media, requires all previously uh, licensed press to register, bars foreign and uh, cross-media ownership, grants the government unlimited rights to prosecute the media, criminalizes defamations of public officials, and increases the defamation fines to 100,000 uh, Ethiopian dollars, almost uh, 10,000 US uh, dollar, which is impossible for any journalist even to think about uh, uh, to pay that amount with the current situations. And this establishing the national security as the uh, grounds for impounding materials prior to publication provides government information officials exclusive disc discretion to withhold sensitive information without judicial review and maintain the Minister of Information, which is uh, uh, absolute uh, power uh, to regulate the media. Um, within the Array of examples provided by the U.S. State Department's Human Rights Report of, on Ethiopia, there is much to be uh, analyzed. Firstly, in an optimistic light, it should be emphasized that Ethiopian constitutionally protects the freedom of the press. Uh, and while there are obvious limitations within the 1992 press law and especially in the new uh, mass media and freedom of information proclamation, the dissolution of the uh, Minister of Information is largely stepped in the direction of protecting the, uh, the, the press. However, it should be demanded that uh, additional uh, political pressures be placed on the Ethiopian government to respect the rights of journalists regardless of their political uh, 
uh, disposition. With these things having been said, uh, there is also an incredible importance need to be integrated that the Ethiopian diaspora and exiled journalists within international uh, internet, alternative academic or media-based outlets outside of Ethiopia. If this doesn't happen, then their voice were effectively uh, silenced by the current political regime in Ethiopia, rather than um, uh, let this, let this uh, uh, loss occur, uh, we find uh, these people to be some of the most important when it comes to testifying against uh, the abuse waged against the Ethiopian press, as well as when it comes to providing accounts of uh, structural inequities within Ethiopia and how they may be uh, remedied. Uh, moreover, uh, these exiles are people uh, best suited to effectively communicate not only to the cities uh, of foreign assistance, um, but also to uh, Ethiopian people themselves. Um, Dovetailing with the suggestion, uh, time should be taken uh, to note the disquieting absence of African journalists in, within the global uh, news media. In response to this problem, exiled journalists' talent and interest must be uh, harnessed. Uh, more African presses must be uh, encouraged, established, and international journalists of any rank must be engaged in forging a uh, positive solution. As PEN USA, PEN America, uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, Human Rights Watch, and uh, other similar organizations, uh, and universities like uh, uh, Cal State uh, Long Beach, especially the journalism program, um, the journalism programs should be actively engaged in this global dialogue and play an active role in creating new generations of journalists who will be agents of positive change in the global uh, landscape. Uh, at the same time, the international news media should be acknowledged, uh, acknowledge freedom of the press as the basic human right and report on censorship of authors as it would any human uh, of, uh, rights violation. In this way, proper attention will be afforded to attempts to establish free presses within individual countries, uh, which will allow this uh, their, uh, the, for their uh, self-presentation, uh, representation and coverage of issues from inside and regions being discussed. In this sense, the establishment of free press within Africa uh, is a critical prerequisite to the ability of external actors to effectively contribute to Africa's development. Uh, to this end, the global news media should be focused on treatment, uh, treatment of African journalists who are uh, our best uh, intermediaries of African issues. Uh, thank you. Thank you again to all the panelists. And um, I wanted to give some time for questions from the audience. I know that some cards were filled out with questions. So uh, perhaps Ken? Yeah, I can handle that. You can you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. Um, well, first question, I realize we lost a, a number of students here going to 1230 classes. Uh, but several panelists, panelists mentioned the, uh, obviously, the changing fate of print journalism, traditional print journalism, and the effect on resources for coverage of issues such as international human rights issues. I just wanted to do a brief poll. How many of the students who are still here regularly read a daily newspaper, say, two or three times a week? Well, I think that's heartening, because this might be a self-selected group of journalism students. Uh, but I just wonder uh, if you have any advice from a student's standpoint, um, if, there's, if there's, you know, if their consciousness has been raised about the importance of these issues, but if, um, if the traditional daily newspaper, the LA Times or whatever it might be, is no longer the most effective way for young people, say the rising generation, um, to, to proactively follow through on the sorts of issues that have been raised today, what would, what would you recommend for them? What should their news gathering strategies be? Um, well, certainly the ability to work on any platform. Uh, but I think, uh, I mean, you guys are going to be fast on whatever media is available, and you know, you're going to be good at that. I think it's a conceptual problem to a certain degree. It's how do we get, um, like, I don't think, 
we don't pretend to have, we're not saying that you should read newspapers because it's good for you, it's, you know, take, take your medicine. We're perfectly prepared to look at and explore other f forms of, of journalism. But I, I'm just wondering what you guys see conceptually um, is, a, is a future way of having these, these discussions. I mean, the internet was supposed to be a way for dialogue to take place across the lines and barriers. Instead, I tend to, I, what I see when I read, and I read extensively, all, all that's what I do is I spend my day trying to look for those other voices that we're supposedly not reporting, is I see people talking to themselves and talking to an echo chamber and speaking in silos. I'm looking for the model whereby we can get, um, we get, get people actually engaging in, in dialogue the way the technology is supposed to allow. It hasn't gotten there, and I don't know how we do that, but if anybody can kind of create a platform for that, I think there, the, where you can have a civilized discussion where, uh, the conversation if it were, you know. Well, this is not so much a problem that is driven by the journalism model and the newsroom model. This is a problem that relates to money, and it's an advertising problem. Newsrooms, I think, were very well equipped, and over the last dozen years or so, have done a very good job of pushing their information to the internet so that it is very available. I read probably seven or eight newspapers a day on the internet. Uh, I'm like a little kid in a candy store. The problem is there is no advertising model that has converted itself so that they can pay for the news gathering. Now, I talk to a lot of people. We need to be a little bit more savvy about where the good quality information is coming from. I hear a lot of people say, well, I don't read newspapers anymore. I get my information on Google and Yahoo. Wrong. As Bruce said, there are no Google reporters, you know, in, in the Gaza Strip. Do you understand? I don't think the public understands where that information comes from. Google, Yahoo, they pick up information from the AP, other news services, and where do those news services get that information? Do you understand how news services work, the AP and whatnot? That they have their own staff in the big cities and internationally. But they take information from their local newspapers and their local television stations. Those folks all belong to the AP. If you don't have a healthy local news gathering operation, whether it be print broadcast or you know, print radio television, you're not going to get Google and Yahoo anymore either. And you have to be conscious of all of that because that information is done by is is being gathered by bona fide journalists, but Google is not out there covering the world. Google is a marvelous information delivery system, but it's a technology. It is not a source of its own independent information, and we all have to be mindful of that. I love newspapers. Uh, that's to me. That's it. That's a Bible. That's a record. I uh, because. Uh, they do such a better job than broadcast journalists uh, many times in covering things. Uh, so I read a lot of papers, I keep up. But this is also a threat to television media. It's shrinking. They're also bailing out like crazy. And like Lucy says, the advertising model is what we need. I'll be starting a blog next week, as a matter of fact, in San Diego with New Media Rights. Uh, and I can email you the link. But we're trying to find a new model that will, uh, that will actually serve people uh, with local news that they're, that's relevant to their lives. I'll be starting that next week because they're, they're not served. I mean, all they're covering is Rex and, uh, you know, Britney Spears or uh, the, the pedophile down the street, and they're, they're just covering that. What about the issues that uh, relate to people? And in San Diego, there's a big need, and I'll be starting that next, uh, next week. I, I wanted to touch upon something that um, Elias mentioned, which was the, the African coverage and um, kind of go back to without throwing the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, reinventing the whole journalistic model, which I think is, was really refreshing to hear Lucy and Bruce and all of you speak about that. But um, that side of, I, I had written now in terms of bias, one of the biases that I see with international coverage is obviously the Western-based assumptions and models, and uh, that's ultimately, that's why we use foreign reporters. We want to 
pair of eyes who can relate to the public back at home to give this view of what's going on so that people can read and relate to that. But how do you see, to the panelists in general, the role of the mainstream media in terms of trying to be self-critical sometimes in, with, with the international coverage, uh, for example, issues like genocide or Africa, Rwanda, which was the example given. Uh, is that a lot of room, for, is there some room for improvement? And, and is the economic down, downturn going to hamper that as well in terms of endanger that even more? Uh, how do you see that? Uh, definitely, after listening to Bruce's presentation, and uh, I have many friends in LA Times also, and uh, recently uh, I went to their office, and what I have witnessed is shocking because of all that beautiful building is almost empty. And many of the desks are uh, computers, and, uh, uh, but no people there. Uh, and I know it, this will affect uh, what I'm trying to uh, present earlier. Uh, I, that's what makes it actually more uh, difficult for me to go out and talk about what I did earlier in Lucy's and uh, uh, Bruce's presentation. So I, I, with the economic situation, that's what I'm, I, 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 I mean. But at the same time, I think uh, still now, it's more uh, the State Department talks about something different, very critical, uh, but at the same time, the government, what the government does is very, totally different. And sometimes uh, we had problems, for example, with Los Angeles Times. I wish, uh, as, as uh, 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 my friend here said, I would have loved to say good things about LA Times, but unfortunately, uh, Bruce is a nice person, but LA Times was very difficult for to cover, specifically the Ethiopian government in 2005, uh, killed 120 people uh, after the, it was after mass of the election. The op all the opposition was imprisoned. The free press was totally uh, was under siege. But Los Angeles Times didn't report it. This is a major news that you should cover on on African front. Uh, and not only that, actually, we went and protested. There was a, maybe just maybe several hundred people to in front of Los Angeles Times, and I was one of the people who was sent to talk to. The, uh, the person who is in office. So those kind of engagement are absent. And so the, even those small stuff they have, I think we have to take initiatives to be able to uh, make a point to cover important uh, life-changing uh, moments of history. And if we don't do those kind of small things, despite the in meager resources that LA Times may have, uh, but at the same time, you'll see them uh, making a coverage or taking time to do a reporting on something is not important as such. So those are the kind of criticism that I have, and that's why actually we need to be more conscious. Uh, it's a very tough issues. situation. Yeah. So maybe one more a question from the audience. Ken, you have a hard job of choosing. Well, that's difficult <laughs> because I have a number. Um, one category is, is uh, media bias. Um, Let's just say, you know, sort of following through on the question I asked before, of course, uh, we do have increased access to alternative media now, like I direct my students towards the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is government funded and which has resources which are not linked specifically to advertising, and where you will find uh, regional updates such as events in Ethiopia when they rise to the level of global news. So I think part of the responsibility does lie with us uh, to, to pursue uh, to be critical consumers of news, and now we have access. Nevertheless, the way issues are framed in the media drive the general discussion, drive the consciousness uh, that we bring to our, our, uh, our consumption of the news. And so the one example I have here is someone who's concerned about, uh, specifically, Bruce, the way the LA Times has been reporting uh, from Venezuela. The LA Times has published 100 articles on Venezuela since April 20, 2007. The overwhelming majority are extremely negative, like the tabloids. Many are of the got you variety, simply pointing to some, <clears throat> to some tie between Venezuela and Russia, China, Cuba, or Iran. So there's, I won't go on with the rest of the question, but basically the, the idea is there's a bias and this uh, list of nations who have sort of a pariah status uh, in the eyes of at least the, the past uh, American administration we'll see going forward that the LA Times in particular and maybe the traditional media in general haven't been critical enough uh, or broad enough in their discussion of those issues. Uh, 
I mean, they can get in line. Everybody that we write about complains about uh, complains about the perception. It's, uh, I mean, generally, if you're in the newspapers, because something not good has happened. Um, so almost by definition, it's going to be it's going to be seen in that light. Uh, the list of calls and emails and angry letters <clears throat> um, is is endless in terms of people being upset with that their particular worldview is not communicated, not just heard, but communicated to 100% of their worldview. It's just one of the things you, that you live with. But do we need to be uh, more open to uh, to hearing voices and to seeing? Uh, world events through different prisms that are not, not from here? Absolutely. I mean, to a certain degree, and I don't want to make too much, uh, not just champion the print side, but to a certain degree, it's interesting coming back to North America after being away for so long, after being away for 12 years, but the degree to which television imposes a narrative on events is extraordinary. So um, when, when Russia and Georgia go to war, the story became very quickly defined by, by cable news and, and the major television networks. Saakashvili was a very competent performer in English. He managed to get a message out. The Russians' default mechanism on media control is either we don't care or we're just bad at it. So very quickly this became a story of tiny democratic Georgia being crushed by the oppressive Russian bear and the bear is back and you know, it, it rolled on very quickly. It fit a format on television and that was hard to break. What we tried to do on, on the print side, we set it specifically to, to try to hear the Russian perspective, not to, not to take sides, but simply to say that there has to be another view of what's going, what's going on in this part of the world. And there was. There's a sense of a country that's being surrounded by, 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 by NATO expansion. They don't want an example of a successful Western economy on their doorstep. A variety of things, like them or not, but the point is it was important to get, those, to get that out. But I agree with you that the stories are shaped and defined to a large degree by the more powerful electronic media, and it's harder to break through that noise right now. But are you going to make people happy all the time? No. Um, can you try harder to make sure that places are not uh, reduced to a caricature so that Iran is not always uh, uh, mullahs screaming you know, death, to his, death to Israel? Yeah, of course. It's a, it's, a, it's a bigger place. It's a broader place. It's millions of people who lead lives. Um, Pakistan is not filled with only uh, religious extremists who are anxious to blow people up and spend time there. And it's a pretty interesting place. People play cricket in the streets at night. Mm -hmm. They do, and I think we need to communicate that, absolutely. As a follow-up to that, if, if the panelists would like to comment uh, on the issue of the, I think the build-up to the Iraq war and, and most of the Bush years, um, there was a, a degree of criticism that was lost in the media, kind of jumping the bandwagon and going with the build-up and everything else. And I think I've seen very little of self-criticism from the part of the media, except for the New York Times in 2004, 2005, making apologies. But in terms of, in general, uh, I don't think the media is, and when I say the media, I'm generalizing, obviously, but talking about the main communication uh, media that we see is not necessarily well-known or very good for making uh, self-criticism self, self and apologies or things like that, or reflecting on the past and learning from experience. Maybe I'm wrong, but do you see that that would be necessary or, and I'm not talking about the LA Times in particular, I'm talking about the Bush years in general and the way things were played out. What do you think? I, I think things changed dramatically right from 2001 to 2005. Um, Right after 9-11, you're absolutely right. We had a series of um, incredibly shocking things happen. And you know, I watched the Pentagon burn from my office window. Uh, it was a terrifying time, and journalists are human beings too. And they uh, particularly, I think, did not want to do anything that would cause this to happen immediately again. A lot of them shed their skepticism. A lot of them got very rah-rah. They were wearing flags on their lapel pins, all of that. I think it was a fairly human response that kind of drove me nuts for a while. Every time I would say anything in print uh, or in a story saying, you know, we need to be skeptical. We need to make the president, the administration, prove that we need to take all of these that, that the reason they are shutting down access to public information is to protect us. We need to make them prove that this is necessary. I would get death threats 
you know, at a peer in Vanity Fair is saying, you know, maybe we need to be a little bit skeptical here. And the next thing I knew, my, you know, inbox and I was getting phone calls and people were going crazy. So that had to have been happening to the mainstream media as well. Um, we don't forget we were lied to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was part of it. Uh, but by about 2004, 2005, I think mainstream media in particular uh, was starting to bounce back a bit, be a little bit more skeptical. And if at the end of the Bush years, if you were to ask whether or not um, the media swallowed everything the Bush administration told them whole, they, the, you know, if you were to ask the former president, he'd look at you like you were out of your mind. I think we were eventually pretty tough on him. Um, should we have been more skeptical? Absolutely but I kind of understand where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, I think in the recent history of America, uh, uh, America became post 9-11 uh, very close to other countries in the world where mm -hmm. this kind of violence perpetrates uh, in a uh, uh, regular basis. Uh, and uh, being the, public, the, the, the community who, who are threatening uh, Lucy, becoming more nationalist, and want, they were not willing to see any kind of criticism of their government so that, you know, to protect their government. Those are the kind of things that uh, we regularly live in uh, these yeah. parts of the, uh, the world, uh, as uh, Bruce can, you know, uh, and, and coming from Ethiopia myself, uh, that's what you see. Uh, and, uh, and the government is the one who is uh, punishing you for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of free expression, and to see for, as a foreigner, as an immigrant, an as an exiled immigrant in America, to see 2004, 2005, and now 2008, seeing America going back to that uh, that freedom that we all love and try to emulate from, learn from, and adapt in our host or uh, country, and I think that's where we want to go. And I think, especially as an institution, I, I, you have to monitor those kind of things and make sure that those things won't repeat again in this country. Mm -hmm. Because if America goes through that path again, mm -hmm. it's very difficult the other to to be able to go back and say that okay, you know, this is the model that you have to follow or return them to where freedom of expression is respected and you'll be safe for what you'll be uh, uh, writing about or for. Very good. I would like to, um, as, as the last kind of wrapping up the panel, to ask the panelists if they could make a, a brief, each one of you, a brief uh, conclusion in terms of being kind of looking towards the future and being positive in terms of one suggestion or one alternative where you see that the, the press could have a very positive influence if we can put it that way, on the way uh, towards the future, uh, or, or something that we can change about j the way journalists work, or governments work, or the press works. I'll start that. <laughs> Maybe Pete can start that. Yeah, I, various things are going through my mind. Is, is why you know I'm investigating in this research blog exactly that in, in terms of local news, and I think that's the positive things uh, as far as news. The local, as far as local news on TV, we know it's broke. I mean, uh, as, as students uh, have said to me, you know, local news sucks, and just <laughs> out and out, they never watch it. Uh, I think is a positive. Let's find out what works. Let's find out how we can bridge uh, uh, that information with newspapers, uh, with television, with the internet, and, and, and make a, have them have them be allies instead of enemies mm -hmm. and, and, and find out how we can survive because our survival, our own survival is at, at stake here. Very good. Lucy? Um, I, I guess I would say my organization we're, is working very hard to try to reach out to all sorts of new media, whether they be organized or disorganized or, or whatever. Um, we're trying, we provide free legal defense services to people who are running into problems um, collecting and, and producing the news. And we are trying to get the word out that the First Amendment doesn't distinguish between journalists and everybody else. And we're, we're just trying to um, attract infra interest 
from some of those folks who are out there independently trying to become, um, you know, voices in their own communities. Uh, I think that's where we're going to have to really rely on support in the future to maintain particularly open government laws on a state and local basis. Again, that's the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Yes, right? rcfp.org. Thank you. Uh, what needs to be done, I think, especially uh, with the current economic situation unraveling, it will be very difficult to say that the media has to do this and that. Uh, so my personal suggestion, especially at the university level and as student body who will re replenish the next generation of journalists, I think w uh, this is an excellent time to be active and study what's happening in the world internationally, especially in the freedom of expression or in this level of engagement. And locally, there is an excellent organization that I think your students or this university part can partner and work with, which is PEN USA. It's PEN, P-E-N-U-S-A dot org. And if you are moving for graduate studies or any other reason to New York, Pan America is another institution that you can affiliate. Through this kind of engagement, I think what you can learn or what you can get into is that you will have an international perspective so that those discrepancies that I was talking about, about in the Africa or in Latin America or Asia issues won't be uh, necessary even to go and rescue them because the students will be uh, passionately you know, engaged and uh, turn uh, uh, what the future will be. Yeah, I just think there's some great, great challenges for the next generation of journalists. It's, a, it's an extraordinary time. No one's here to be sort of the stewards of something that was invented before and you just follow it along. This is all, I mean, it's a revolutionary time. Um, so, I mean, one opportunity is to, is to find a, a model for online journalism where people do real, real journalism that's, that's specific to that medium and it's not just newspapers or television transplanted into it, but looks at, at uh, looks at the net as a, uh, as a separate medium and finds a way to do real journalism on it. And then the other is to protect newspapers um, the way we might have protected, uh, I don't know, radio when television came along or theater before that. But, but it's still, uh, it's a particular medium that delivers a particular experience. And the more and more that the, that, that algorithms come to uh, dictate our lives and tell us, you know, exactly what we want and what uh, and reinforce all of our prejudices um, just think that it's I think the newspaper is worth preserving because it offers that serendipitous serendipitous experience of uh, of just catching your eye with something you didn't know was out there before very good thank you very much thank you all for being here